Oh my goodness, this is beautiful. Welcome back, Troglodytes, to your daily dose of guitar information, the Troglodytes Guitar Show. Over on Facebook, you can find groups that are basically like the modern day equivalent of a guitar forum, and one that I watch is called the Gibson Les Paul. And there's tons and tons of posts that go on every single day. Sometimes you see some rare guitars, sometimes you just see some interesting models. It's a great way to immerse yourself in how many different models have been made. But occasionally, you get a real gem of a post. And this one was done by Keith here, who was apparently one of Gibson's lawyers during their whole debacle. But he shared not one photo, but two photos of some of the behind the scenes with this. So I'm imagining these lawyers are fighting it out against each other. They have all these deans in the courtroom. You've got all these Gibsons and Epiphones over here. We're taking them to the stand, comparing them to see does Gibson have a valid point here. And this topic has been done to death so much. The only reason I wanted to bring it up again was this right here. <laughs> oh, Gibson, Gibson, Gibson. That, that is such a cheeky move. The brand has so many explorers, from the original Karina ones looking like this, maybe even some crazy curly maple top models from the 80s, and a few different variations in between. But Gibson, I'm sorry, you have never ever produced an explorer like that. But who is somebody that I do know that has produced an explorer like that? Oh, it's right over here. It's Dean. <laughs> Beautiful vintage Deans look like that. Explorers with the whole string through style. Now their V plate is a little bit offset. That's what makes them a little bit more different. But as far as that beautiful blue burst, that is totally out of their book. So the fact that they brought that to the courtroom, I just found incredibly hilarious. And it's just such a cool guitar. I wish Gibson would just make a run of these now and give them some fancy name. Like we have the government models, which were the big fingers in the air. And now this one will, will be like their victory lap. So I'm not sure that was entirely fair to bring, but if we're being literal here, Gibson first used that on their Flying V back in the 50s, so they own that. Nobody owns the color blue. Well, in this context anyways. So they were in the total right to be able to bring this, but I just found that pretty funny. It's also interesting to see the 2013 Rudolf Schenker signature Scorpions Flying V. We had talked about this reissue in my review of the original 80s. Other than that, we've got an interesting pickup coverless SG right here from Gibson. We've got a 64 style 335 with the flame top. We've got an Epiphone SG, Epiphone 335, some sort of a interesting Les Paul standard in like a fireball color. We've got our Epiphone Flying V and an Epiphone Explorer among a couple other like Lunas and other Deans in the back here. And then I would love to tell you each and every single one of these models, but I just don't know. But these are the shapes that they have issues with. The Vs, the Zs, as they call them. The Grand Sport model, if I remember correctly, is their like SG style one. And then the Luna brand had some like 335 copies that they didn't like. But if nothing else, Keith, thank you for sharing these photos. It's kind of cool to see some of the behind the scenes and just hilarious to see that one in there. Oh my goodness, Gibson needs to slap stickers on the back of them or a plaque saying, this is the one we use to win the lawsuit. <laughs> and then sell it off on that whole buy shares of our guitar thing that we talked about in this episode. Speaking of which, how did that ever pan out? Looks like the double neck got completely funded. This one's still coming soon or maybe they decided that they don't want to do it. I'm not sure. Next up on our agenda tonight, we have three new Japan exclusive, exclusive guitars. So if you're new to the show, what does that mean? It means Fender Japan's website has a section that says online only, and Fender Japan does not ship outside of Japan. So whereas most Japan exclusive guitars, you might be able to find a dealer to ship it to you in the USA, you can't get this one unless you know somebody in Japan that'll buy it for you and ship it out. So that's why I call it an exclusive, exclusive, or should I just call them exclusive proper? But we've got three new ones. The first one, it's a hybrid two Telecaster thin line. And looking at this at first, I thought, okay, it's like a blonde thin line Telecaster. What's so new here? We've got a natural back. That's kind of interesting. But then I read our title here. Gold top. Oh, okay. I guess that is kind of cool. And apparently that's not just a gold top. That's gold sparkle top. The gold top finish, hearkening back mainly to a Gibson. So that's interesting. Now we need a dark back version, but I think light back works best because you want to keep the maple neck the way it is. 
and it's got sweet wood grain going on back here. It really reminds me of the Brit Daniel signature Telecaster, except for this one's actually natural, and the back has that yellowish color too. And this one's made in Japan instead of USA, so the pricing's completely different. So this one is 148,500 yen. Following that up, another one from the Hybrid 2 series. This is Graffiti Yellow. So if you like white racing stripes, this one's kind of interesting because it's got your regular racing stripe here. But due to the contour of the body and how rounded it is, it looks very strange in that area. But I suppose it would look strange even if they tried to make it look straight because it just wouldn't line up properly. But you've got this whole hot rod yellow look. You've got the humbucker in the bridge. So it's a really souped up Stratocaster matching the whole finish vibes here. But that's a nice dark fretboard on here. You almost need a matching headstock on this model. I'm kind of surprised to see that they did not continue the racing stripe design on the back. And we don't have any fast flamed neck back here. It's pretty basic in that attribute. I'd like to see more colors of these. And based on the whole limited, limited nature of it, I bet we might see some more colors. But the last one speaks to me the most. It's a traditional Jazz Master in an awesome sonic blue finish. Bam! Matching headstock with the body. You've got the red tortoise shell like guard. Chrome hardware with the off-white plastics. Says it's a basswood body. Maple neck. Wow, that's a really dark rosewood fretboard in that photo. But then look at the back of this neck, all that ringy wood grain. Yeah, I would totally love to buy the stock photo example. That's a nice one. But I'm sure any one you get would be nice. Because all things considered, what you're getting at that price really is not all that expensive for a name brand product. Oh my goodness, it does have the lead rhythm circuit. I didn't even notice that. And now for a couple of interesting guitars that were shared to me. We had this Gibson Les Paul Standard 120th Anniversary from 2014, and they thought the color was pretty nice, and I had to agree with them. Now, 2014 standards, maybe not the most desirable in specs. They've got the interesting 120th Anniversary inlay there, and they've got the whole wider headstock with the black nut. But when you flip over to the back of this one, it's still a natural color. And then do you see that, my friends? It's got a flamed mahogany back. You do not see that that often in the 2014 era. And it looks like the neck would have maybe a little bit of dancing to it as well. That seems like a pretty solid buy for 2200, but for the first 30 days, only local guys. So if you are in the Natick, Massachusetts area, maybe go check it out. That could be the guitar for you. And to round out our episode tonight, I've got reverb finds. So here's an interesting 1984 Gibson Explorer. There's two interesting things to know about this one. So first off, it's got one of the fancy Gibson tremolo systems that's not the Kaler. They had the Pro Tune and the Master Tune. They pretty well only lived one year. So 1984 is when you mainly find these. But the other interesting feature about this one is just the finish itself. Now, when I first saw this, I instantly thought, yeah, that, that had to have been refinished. And I was not incorrect with that. However, look at the figuring in the body right there. It's a shame that Gibson had to cover that up back in the 80s. But I guess to be fair, the rest of the body's pretty plain. I can imagine how the story went now. Somebody wore through by the control knobs, thought, oh yeah, I can see all the wood grain figuring. Let's go ahead and strip it. And then they, they found this. <laughs> it's not a bad looking one, but look at the back. Ah. Oh. That is gorgeous. Imagine the entire thing done up like that. And this is from the Alder body era of the Explorer, which I'll be honest, I haven't looked at a lot of Alder guitars to look at the grain and be like, yeah, 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 but I've never seen Alder <laughs> look like that. But then we've also got our maple neck here. Yeah, it's got a little bit of a Chateauian effect to it, but nothing too crazy. I mean, it looks like our pick guard's been replaced. Pickups have all been done up. I'm surprised they didn't fill in the trem unit and just convert it into a more natural Explorer. But, ah, oh, okay. I didn't realize this before. It's probably not an added explorer, so this might not be the Alder body version. Because you can find two different low-end explorers in this era. You can find the one that still has the traditional three-in-a-line layout with the pick guard and your toggle switch up here, and then you can find the triangle knob thrash metal version that didn't have the pick guard. So maybe there was some differences within their body woods. But we can definitely tell it had some sort of a locking nut on it at one point in time that's been swapped out. We can still see our serial number, so that's good. Oh, wow. Still has the Dirty Fingers pickups in here and the original case. So if you're interested in that one with shipping from Sweden, it's about 2,500. I mean, these 80s Explorers are pretty expensive, especially if you want this layout and not the proper Karina style. It's got enough of a vibe to it. I see that selling. 
So these Les Paul artists, that's right, not artisan, artist. It's the Les Paul, kind of a custom, except for the fact that they do not have binding on the back, so it's more so akin to a standard in that aspect. But they're unique because they have the built-in Moog electronics. Now, do these things sound fantastic? Not really. Now, if you changed out all the capacitors and everything to current day specs, would they probably sound better? Yeah, but in my experience of playing with these a few years back when you could get them pretty cheap, I mean, we're talking 16 to 2200 is used to be the market for these. And I honestly still think it kind of is. It's just there's not as many on the market and people's asking prices have been raising because of that. But this one has some pretty heavy tarnishing to the gold. So I'm still kind of looking for like my very good clean condition one for the future museum. So from this leading photo, I was hoping that was it, but not quite. I mean, this one would probably clean up okay. But you could also check out like an RD artist or a 335 artist those are also out there but this one's got some neckwear so somebody enjoyed playing it and also keep in mind you don't have to have any of that stuff on you can just play it as a regular les paul custom if you don't want any of the fancy onboard stuff but if i remember correctly you still have to have the battery installed in the back and that's a bit of a pain if you ever want a deal on a custom shot firebird find one of these non-reverse ones you shouldn't really be paying much more than 28 to 3500 which is pretty good for a custom shop gibson but Ooh, that one's pretty beat up. Definitely gigged. Did they tape the strap to the guitar? I guess they don't trust strap locks, but I bet that would clean up pretty good. That's kind of funny. This is a fantastic custom. I even tried to buy it. What makes this interesting is the chevron flame top. So if you haven't heard that term before, chevron. It refers to the direction that the flame is going. So if you got it straight across, you don't have any chevron going on. However, if it goes up, it's considered chevron. If it goes down, that's called reverse chevron. So the way to remember that is the word chevron has a V in the center. But you have to remember it's the opposite of that V. So a chevron top goes this way. That's how I remember it anyways. But this is beautiful. Uncovered supposedly from the factory zebra bobbin pickups with that interesting wood grain with the nice natural coloring the first four pictures are all from the side which is awesome because you get to see the mahogany coloring right here but it's a full-on les paul custom but what really shocked me is the, okay this thing is from 2014 we've got a lot of pitting going on to our grover tuners but that's easy enough to replace if you don't like it somebody moved the tone sticker from the pick guard but to our back plate you've got awesome wood grain back here and the medallion that's like one of the first years that gibson started doing those medallions so i just thought this was a pretty particularly nice example. I'd probably ask a few more questions about condition before importing it from Singapore. However, around 5,000 bucks, I really think you'd be happy with that. And lastly, an offering from Little Tokyo Vintage in Los Angeles, California. With a suspicious price tag of $8,888. Seems like somebody's just pressing numbers over here on the keyboard. We've got a real clown bursty Les Paul standard here. But Slash has just very recently signed it. And I only wanted to talk about this one because I was interested to get your guys' thoughts and opinions on this. A true vintage guitar at this point, signed by Slash 42 years after it was made. Now, if this signature was dated back to the 80s, I think it would make more sense. But what really kind of stinks here is this looks like a very clean condition 82 standard, had the special three point adjust a matic bridge. I like Slash as much as the next guy, but I would rather have that on a brand new Les Paul rather than this vintage original since the dates are just so. So strange. I guess if we're being fair here, it's a non-original case. It's a slightly later 80s slash early 90s pink blanket variation. But they do have an authenticity check on that and the backstage access pass where it was likely signed at. But ah, okay. His listing says for Leo. So somebody was just pushing stuff on there. He, he likely had an offer available on this and it was only listed at a crazy price. That way nobody else would try to buy it. That makes a lot more sense. So maybe he commissioned these guys to go take it to Slash at his show because he's too busy being a doctor and get it signed. I'm sure there's a story behind this, but that's a really cool 82 Les Paul standard. If it is as clean as it looks, just that in its own right, probably maxing out around 5,000. But I think that's enough fun for tonight, my friends. Don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe, and we'll catch you tomorrow on the next one. Take care.